Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at Strand. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 91 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family and still housing new and used books. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome National Leader for Women's Rights, Cecile Richards for the paperback launch of her New York Times best-selling book, Make Trouble, Stand Up, Speak Out, and Find the Courage to Lead. Cecile has been a national leader for women's rights for years and is the former president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. She has worked as a labor organizer, is on the board of the Ford Foundation, and was one of the founders of America Votes, an organization that aims to coordinate and promote progressive issues and is currently serving as its president. Cecile was also chief of staff to Nancy Pelosi, has worked at the Turner Foundation, and in 1996, she founded the Texas Freedom Network. She also serves on the Board of Advisors for Lit America Vote, an organization that aims to end voter suppression. Joining Cecile is writer, podcast host, and co-founder of Tech Lady Mafia, Amina So. Amina has been named on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list for her work on Tech Lady Mafia, as well as her work as a digital engagement director for veterans organization IAVA. Amina is also the co-host of the hit podcast, Call Your Girlfriend friend, is a member of the Sundance Institute's Directors Advisory Group and previously led social impact marketing at Google. Please join me in welcoming Cecile and Amina to Strand. Is this on? Can, Can you hear us? On? Yes, yeah. perfect. Okay. Ooh, a lot of friendly faces in the audience. Love it. Um, thanks so much for coming, everyone. We um, have gotten some questions from the audience that were um, sent beforehand, so I will be weaving these into our conversations. Some of them are, uh, you know, very high level, and some of them are hilarious. So <laughs> I. <laughs> so honestly, uh, you know, we're not shaming anybody here. We'll have a good time. Hi, Cecile. Thanks Hi, so much for Amina. coming. Thanks for doing this. Uh, it's been a year since your book came out. That's pretty exciting. You've been on yeah, tour. It's been great. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And uh, I'm excited to go back out to some of the hot spots in America. That's awesome. Like, um, when you were, you know, when the book was coming out last year, uh, you were also stepping down from Planned Parenthood. And I think a lot of us thought that you were running for office. I think there's still time. Um, <laughs> if you want to throw your hat in the ring. Uh, can you tell us what you've been up to this last year? Absolutely. And in fact, I I write about a little bit in the, on the um, addendum, or what do we call it, epilogue of the book. Uh, but yeah, I once I left Planned Parenthood, and there's probably some Planned Parenthood folks in the audience, and kind of just say, they are the most important people in this world. The work they do every day, walk into health centers and provide health care to folks. I just always have to give a shout out to everyone who works at Planned Parenthood. So if that's OK, before we, so. Um, but I, um, one of the things I learned at Planned Parenthood over the years was that even though we were providing health care to millions of folks, that a lot of our patients had other issues as well. Mm -hmm. And so I spent the last few months traveling around the country listening to women about what else is on their mind. And I've just been really kind of blown away by, uh, I thought, I guess I thought what I would find is that women were just feeling completely beat down and burned out, which is an understandable reaction to what they've been dealing with uh, under this administration. But actually we found just the opposite, which is women are completely on fire. They are um, newly ag agitated, organized, activating, uh, you know, when you go to Ohio, you can't throw a rock without hitting a new women's group that's popped up. And so I'm really now working with some other women that um, you probably know, I, Jen Poo from the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Alicia Garza from one of the founders of Black Lives Matter and some other women who are here in the audience um, to, we hope next month, launch a new women's organization to build women's political power in the United States and change the direction of the country. So that's what I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> 
You know, when the book came out um, a year ago, the response was huge. We had you on our podcast and we had so many people, you know, just anecdotally tell us how, just how much it meant to them. Um, one, that you had written this and that it, it just felt like such a generous, um, you know, like guide to impart wisdom on people. Was there anything in the response that surprised you and how people received the book? Well, I think it's, um, and by, I, I want to say my co-author, Lauren Peterson, is here, who's, also, who's a brilliant writer and my partner in crime and what? everything. Um, and we also have the same hairdo now. Anyway, there's just a lot of things that have happened over the last year. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, and I think Lauren would say the same thing. The amazing thing about going on book tour was that book events were not, they weren't like book events. They were like revivals. I mean, it was just... Everywhere we went, and particularly in small towns or in, I would say, states where there was less support for women's rights, just women came out of the woodwork. And I think the most common question they asked, of course, is one of the questions I tried to answer in the book, which is, what should I do? It's just, I think women feel like they want to do more. They're feeling like, um, and they're feeling inspired by what other women are doing. They want to know what other women are doing to be successful. And I think we saw a lot of the results of that activism in this last election. Mm -hmm. when we had, of course, record number of women run for office, record number of women of color go to Congress, just a whole lot of things that actually I think are, that are demonstrate, you know, that really are a result of women's activism. You know, one of the things that we hear about so much and that you speak um, so eloquently about in the book is just this idea that you don't feel ready or you don't know your place or, you know, like, where do you start and what do you, there's, there's so much self-doubt and we hear it in people who want to be activists. We hear it from women who, you know, think that they want to run for office or they, you know, they want to take a stand about it. And I just wonder if you could share maybe a moment in your life where you, you were faced with that self-doubt and what helped you overcome that? Sure. So, I mean, I write about in my book, actually, the biggest moment of self-doubt was that I wasn't sure I should go to the interview for the job at Planned Parenthood because I, um, I mean, first, I couldn't believe they'd called me. I was, like, so excited. And then, of course, I went through everything in my head, like, oh, my God, I don't have the right degree. I have not. The, I don't have the right experience. I've never done anything that, that big. And so I was actually on my way to the job interview, and... I was about to cancel. I thought, I'm just going to call him and say, I just can't, can't do this. But so I stopped in this coffee shop and did what any grown woman would do. And I called my mother and I said, <laughs> I said, I, I don't know, mom, I just don't think I can do this. And she was like, Cecile, just get over yourself. This is, <laughs> she said, look, Planned Parenthood is the most important healthcare provider to women in the country. This is the most exciting opportunity you've ever had. And you will never forgive yourself if you don't try. And so I guess my mom is the reason I got over it. Um, and I just wish everyone had an Ann Richards in their life to just tell them to just go for it. Um, because that's kind of what she did. She started before she was ready, right? She did yeah. it even though they said, you're not the one, it's not your time. And I think she was just such a big believer in, if you wait till it's your turn, or you wait till someone asks you, it's all going to pass you by. And so that's, that's now, that's my message for every woman in this country, which is start before you're ready. You know, and the answer, no matter what the question is, the answer is yes, you can do it. I am just stunned that you thought you were not qualified for that job. Uh, well, I wasn't qualified, but you know what? That's the thing about women. Even when we're not qualified, we do it anyway, yeah. right? And we usually do a pretty pretty damn good job of it. So I think that we're just told a lot of messages about um, what we not aren't capable of. Mm -hmm. And I think what I found in my 12 years at Planned Parenthood is that I was personally capable of a lot more than I thought mm -hmm. I was. And so were the millions of women um, and other folks uh, in the country who supported and believed in Planned Parenthood. Look, it was that group of people that actually stopped the defunding of Planned Parenthood under the Trump administration. So if we can do that, we can do almost anything. <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, one of the, I think that one of the times that, that as, as a country, we fell in love with you all over again, was watching you just take fire from Congress over the bogus videos that they were they were trying to push. And the, just the composure that you had, the, 
You and you write about this, and it's a thing that I think a lot of us recognize when you when you come under fire and you just go into power saving mode, where you go, <laughs> okay, like I am just yep. you're like I'm gonna lower my temperature. I'm gonna listen to these idiots. Here is what is going on here. Right. Um, I just like I wonder how how it has felt to just you know now that you have had some remove from it, like all of those years of of constantly being under fire. Like if that has taken some sort of emotional toll on you and how you have and how you've dealt with that no I mean if anything I miss it I just like love being in the battle and although that that particular episode with Congress was um was hard it did tell it taught me a lot of things Mm -hmm. one was yeah don't take the bait as you say you know kind of just remember who you're really there for and that I wasn't there for Jason Chaffetz or Trey Gowdy or any of the men who were pointing their finger at me. I was there for the millions of women who were not going to have the chance to testify before Congress Mm -hmm. and to try to tell a little bit about what it's like to be um, a person who has no access to health care and who depends on a place like Planned Parenthood uh, and how important that is. And so that gives you a lot of resolve. Um, You also kind of have to keep a sense of humor because I remember in the middle of this after like you know two and a half hours of like these men yelling at me um, my son Daniel texted me and he says mom I'm watching you on TV you're doing such a good job I'm really proud of you I think raising me all those years really helped you prepare for this today (laughs) (laughs) like exactly that's correct Um, so I think that's the other thing about being an activist Mm -hmm. and being a troublemaker is you've got to find the humor and the joy in it. Otherwise, you just won't make it. It's true. I just, I'm just i just picturing Trey Gowdy, and I, I think it occurs to me that he's also just jealous that you have the better hair. And so, <laughs> as we all know. I don't use as much product. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I've heard you talk about a lot, too, is acknowledging the privilege of who gets to make trouble, right? Because I think that it is... Um, you know, it's it's an instinct that a lot of people have, but unfortunately we live in a world where there are different incentives and rewards for being a troublemaker. And so I wonder if you could speak to that. No, I think that's a really good point. And I have thought about it a lot, particularly in this environment when there's a lot of people who aren't even trying to make trouble and yet they are being punished, they're being you know, uh, penalized by our government. And I f- so I feel like it's really important for those of us who can um, use our, whether it's our privilege or whatever else we have to um, do good or make trouble for good, I think we just have to recognize that that is not an option that many, many people have. I, and I worked, I talk about you know, my own upbringing was really, uh, or my, you know, my first job out of college was working with uh, women in New Orleans who cleaned the hotel rooms for minimum wage. And these are women who, they didn't have any options. They didn't, you know, they couldn't, there weren't a lot of options for um, women in, in New Orleans to make um, make money or, you know, have a big career. And they were just doing the best they can. But you know what? They chose to be troublemakers anyway. And I will never forget them because here they were, you know, working often two jobs, often raising kids on their own, making minimum wage. And yet they decided to help to try to organize a union to make things better and they probably figured it wasn't going to be for themselves it was going to be for the women that came after them and so I've always I I really try to remember that um, having the option for what you do for a living is an enormous privilege that most people will never have and then really respect the people who make trouble um, when they have really nothing to fall back on and those are the women that I I try to hold with me and think about um, when we do this work Um, You know, you talk a lot also about if you are going to be an activist, like really having to play a long game and getting used to losing a lot. Like you. Yeah, almost always. Yeah. You lose almost always. And then when you win, it's huge. And so I'm just like curious if you could talk about, you know, like how. Um, like how you really learn that perseverance because I think that you know especially in this climate we like we hold our wins very closely but we're also used to losing a lot and that is so demoralizing right well no and it I mean I guess if you're winning a lot you're probably not trying your goals aren't high enough because Mm -hmm. I think if we really are fighting for 
you know, true equality, um, social justice. These are things that are big ideas. They're not things that, you know, that are won always through incremental change. Um, so I guess I, th I feel like, yeah, you have to realize that we're, we're aiming for stuff big, but then you also have to learn how to celebrate the little victories because I think one of the things that's hard right now, and I also, have, I think I have grown to appreciate more that given the sustained attacks so many folks feel under and communities feel under, that we also have to recognize that sometimes you just have to take someone else's place on the field and say, it's okay. If you need to like take a break or you need to do something else, we'll be there and we'll hold that spot because this is gonna be hard. And I don't care what happens in 2020, the damage that's been done is gonna take a lot longer mm -hmm. than a new administration um, to to get over. So I think that we have to you know, really support each other in that kind of way. But the other thing is sometimes you do have to think, like I remember one of the things I was dealing with when we were under the defunding um, threat under, um, 45, um, I just can't say it, I just can't say his name. Um, <laughs> but it was hard because I thought we didn't have the votes, right? Mm -hmm. And as I was told by some of the people in the administration, you know, the Republicans control everything, you guys have got to make a deal, but, and we, of course, wouldn't and, and kept fighting. And I thought, I don't know how we'll ever win that final vote because we don't have the votes in the Senate. Um, but I, I realized, and a friend of mine who was in the environmental movement said, just think about how many people come to Planned Parenthood each day. And if you could just think about that, that'll help, that'll make each day is important. Mm -hmm. And I did the math and I figured out that every day we kept the doors open, approximately 5,814 people got health care that day. Mm. So that was a good day. And I think sometimes you do have to just, um, and you have to celebrate the wins when you get them. Because I think that's the other thing as progressives too often, because we do have a bigger vision, we don't stop and go, that was big, what we just did. Like defeating the, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act and defeating the defunding of Planned Parenthood, that was really big. And it was important to stop for a moment and just say, there's a lot of other fights coming, but we at least have to stop and recognize that and people own that because that happened because millions of people took action. Mm -hmm. That's important. Well, I'm going to go to our first audience question. Good. I hope it's something funny. I feel like Listen, I'm being super oh, serious and like kind yeah, of no, a downer we're, we're here. We're definitely taking down like 20 notches. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite food, Cecile? Oh, I love these. My favorite food. Uh, oh, wow. Well, um, I'm a cook, so I love almost all kinds of food. But I, and I'm from Texas, um, although I be became a vegetarian at age 12, I think just to annoy my parents. And um, so... Uh, but uh, so being from Texas, I would say chalupas. And you probably don't even know what a chalupa is, but I'll tell you how to make it later. I love this. Fry I a tortilla this. and put everything on top. Anyway. I, yeah. Cecile Richards, the cookbook. I will buy it. <laughs> um, the next question is, do you have any advice for young women looking to work in reproductive rights and women's issues in the future? Yes. Number one, do it. Um, because I think that I mean, for all my you know, optimism about the movement and the fact that there are more folks than ever, the fights that are coming are gonna be um, hard and they're gonna be in every single state. And honestly, you know, help isn't coming from Washington, D.C. I think that's just the most important thing that we can know. And so if you can't get a job, and I know a lot of um, young people want to work for an organization that's doing reproductive rights, and those jobs are probably few and far between, but there are all kinds of ways in any community in this country, you can either create your own organization or volunteer, whether it's with a health center, whether it's helping just do a small fundraiser to help support women who can't afford services or whatever it is. And that's how you actually get involved. And then I think once you get kind of, it's just like volunteering on a campaign. I always tell people who want to work on a campaign, the, the fastest way to work on a campaign is volunteer on a campaign. Because then they look, then you're there and you're working and then it goes, oh my God, why don't we just hire her? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I just think that's kind of how the world works and, um, and don't overthink it. Um, that's the other thing, I guess I just, I was thinking, Amina, that, I think right now, I, I remember right after the election, um, like I couldn't, like I, every time I got on the subway, someone would just like look at me with this stricken look and say, what am I supposed to do? As if like there was this, like if I did one thing, there was one thing I could do and it would all get better. And that isn't true. And so it doesn't matter if you don't do the exact right thing. Just do something. <laughs> just do more than you're doing. Because if you do, and if we all do more, 
that's how we're going to change things. And also, I think that's how you're going to meet other people that are going to inspire you to keep going because this is not a solitary thing. This is, we need a mass, mass movement in this country um, of women and people who care about women to fight for full equality. And that's the only way it's gonna change. Help is not on the way. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And, and, and I think it's important to not overthink it um, and just get busy. Um, can you give us um, maybe some examples or talk about um, some organizations or you know young people who are newer to the repro right space right. that um, give you a lot of hope, like people that are, you just really think we should know about? Oh my gosh! Well, I mean, there's there are so many. Obviously, there's the big organizations, and I think any of them, a lot of them have chapters, and they do things um, both here in New York and around the country. So Beyond Planned Parenthood, certainly NARAL Pro-Choice America, the Center for Reproductive Rights, the American Civil Liberties Union. I mean, all of us have been partners. And then, but there are lots of small groups. Um, there are abortion funds that need always need help raising money to help support women who um, need need uh, financial support. There's Sister Song, which has like been in the lead of the reproductive justice movement for forever and doing phenomenal work. Um, I you know I think there there's there you know you can't really make a mistake. Everyone needs help and support. And again, I think it's the way uh, you could also meet other people, uh, women and beyond, who want to do this work with you. And that that in and of itself will make you feel better. Um, here is another audience question that I love because the sentiment is right. First off, thank you for being an inspiration and a total rock star. Just had to say it. Anywho, question. Um, whoever wrote this, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so clear. Um, in an age when the closing of civic space is a rising uh, is a rising issue and it's affecting repro rights, how can we guarantee that women have access not just to the services but access to information regarding their rights to reproductive and sexual health? Oh my gosh, that are like, yeah, that's. Um, this is really scary, and for those of you who don't know, I just just. This country, this administration, um, has just announced a domestic gag order. And I think it's really important because we live in New York, or I guess most of you live in New York, where we think of you know, public health care being available. But this new domestic gag order would actually mean that doctors, clinicians, other people that are in the public health space, if they participate in the family planning program, literally are prohibited from telling women and their other and other patients their rights to safe and legal abortion, referring them uh, to care that they might need. It is literally going to become illegal for them to do that. That is so chilling. So when you talk about mm -hmm. what's happening, it's not just getting you know, good information, whether be able to like go go online and find sources you sources you trust, but the fact that medical providers, in my opinion, are now going to be denied the right to even live up to their Hippocratic oath to provide the best care for their patients, that is really, really frightening. And so part of this is going to be women are going to have to find, women and other people are going to have to find other other sources of good information, um, and it's, it's one of the, there isn't any one simple answer, but that's why, um, I mean, the work that we did at Planned Parenthood for years was invest in the online and digital space, so that you know now you can use your cell phone and find get an appointment um, uh, and get other information that you need because. I guess the one thing I learned after having to deal with this Congress and all the kinds of restrictions they were putting on um, folks at the clinic level is that the one thing Congress couldn't do, at least they haven't figured it out yet, is that they could not uninvent the internet. And and that was really like a big, you know, that was a big realization because basically anything we could put on a mobile phone. Um, that's as close to young people as you're gonna you're gonna get these days, and so I do I do um, find hope and joy in the fact that there are some things that even Congress um, can't shut down. Well, we'll we'll see how creative yeah, they get. No, exactly about that. Um, another audience question: Have you ever changed the mind of someone on the far right regarding abortion, and if yes, how? Million dollar question. Yeah. How do we how do we do it? <laughs> 
Yeah, I would love to say that Trey Gowdy is now a supporter of Planned Parenthood, but <laughs> I think you I'm should just say that him. regardless. I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> like where you go? Well, I I can't say that I have personally, mm -hmm. um, but I like to think that the the kind of the family, and I'll just speak the Planned Parenthood family because that's where I lived um, for so many years. By doing the work that we do and providing information and education and keeping the doors open for anyone, like we're as we say, we're a judgment-free zone and. It is amazing um, because, of course, life always takes unexpected turns, but um, it is not uncommon for someone who has been picketing a health center at Planned Parenthood to show up one day needing care and services, right? I see some folks nodding in the audience because this has been the experience of folks. And so I think what is important is that um, we are judgment-free and realize that people come to their decision-making um, a lot of different ways, and and partly is because um, they may think something is a political issue, and then find out actually it's a deeply personal issue. And that's how I feel about the issue of abortion. Is um, I respect anyone's uh, personal opinion about abortion, about whether they would have one, what they, you know, but um, I. I don't think ever that it is a politician, that a politician is in a better position to make a decision for a pregnant person than that person themselves. And I think if we hold that truth and don't judge people, um, more people come our way. And it is interesting right now, actually, and I think partly because we're living under an administration that is so, um, has been so tough on, on women, uh, that support for Roe is highest that it's ever been in, in, in America. Um, and ironically, of course, because of the work that was done under the Affordable Care Act and finally getting birth control covered for all people, amazing, what an idea. Um, we're actually at the lowest teenage pregnancy rate in the history of the United States of America. <laughs> A 30 year, yeah, exactly. I mean, despite the politics, progress is being made. And I think that's the other thing is it, it I try to say to some of our antagonists, like, don't just believe me. Listen to medical professionals, because they are the first ones to say the most important decisions that people make about their health care. They have to be made, well, trust women, and then trust medical providers to help women um, when they need that, and don't interfere. So, and people do, people do change their minds, um, but a lot of it is based on their own personal experience. Um, I want to get back to some of the stuff that you wrote in the in the book. I loved, obviously, like loved reading about your mom, um, who, like you know, personal shiro to so many people. Um, loved reading also what you wrote about working with Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. and you know, I think that a lot of younger women also look to you for that same kind of inspiration and resolve and tenacity. And I just, I'm just curious if you could share your thoughts about like how, like how do you feel about, um, how do you feel about that? The fact that a lot of people look Being up to you, and the fact that you, you know, there <laughs> is, but you know, I think that like we generally erase women as yeah. they get older yeah. and uh, I'm I'm I am glad that that is not true for that is not true for you it's not true for a lot of the women that you write about in this book but I do think that um, a lot of times we don't acknowledge the the pressure that is put on you in that leadership yeah. role and I just wonder if you have anything to say about that um, so a couple of things well one so some folks in this audience probably don't even know that my mother was Ann Richards who was the former governor of, of Texas for a hot second um, for four years we the had a progressive second I mean it was like <laughs> whoa and gone and that was it but um, but we made the most of those four years that's for sure um, because I don't like to assume people um, even know about mom, because um, obviously there's a generation of women who don't. I so I um, I guess what brings me joy is um, seeing young women coming into their own, and so it's not even like I don't like expect anyone to respect me or look up to me. I just want to make sure that all of us who've had the privilege of being troublemakers or being agitators or being in this fight for social justice, that we are investing in a new generation to come along. Because to me, that's the failing in many ways of the progressive community is that um, folks either get in positions of like, you know, power and prestige um, 
or they just kind of forget where they came from. And so to me, it was one of the things that I loved about Planned Parenthood is that we were able to take resources and invest in, you know, millions of new young people coming into the fold because, I mean, selfishly, one, it, it rebuilt our movement, you know, from 3 million to more than 12 million supporters, um, which is, by the way, almost twice the size of the National Rifle Association, okay? So it was worth doing that just to kind of build, um, yeah, woo! And, um, <laughs> And, and young people change the organization. It's not just young people because then you have more activists, it's because young people then demand that the organization change. They demand transgender services for folks in this country, right? They demand changes in the way we approach things like um, sex education and um, delivery of care. And that to me is what keeps a movement a movement. Um, so I have no, I love being with young people because they ch they're challenging, um, they have new ideas. And again, I just think we have to do, we have to do more of that in the progressive space, invest in them. Because one thing I learned too, I I mean, this is just something to keep in your head. So every year, approximately 4 million young people turn 18, okay? So since the last presidential election, if my math is right, that's about 16 million young people that are gonna be eligible to vote in 2020 that weren't eligible. So we should be investing every single moment of our day and our time in them because they are the future and they are the ones who are gonna save us. Um, I love how much you talk about goal setting also, you know, like the book is definitely like part memoir and then it's very tactical. I was really surprised by that. Um, and I, now I'm just like picturing you notebook, writing down your goals, like how do I get everything that I want? Um, and I just, you know, like, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like the, the tactical approaches that you have to goal setting? Well, I mean, I, I came up I came up as a union organizer and like if you couldn't count votes, you couldn't win. And so I mean and I came out of politics where again, it's like there was a day and you're either win or lose depending on if you got fifty one percent or not. And actually that's something I, I do say about Nancy Pelosi. You'd ask me about her. There's a lot of stories I could tell you about Nancy. I, I learned so much from her. But one of the reasons that she's Speaker of the House is because she knows how to count votes, okay? I'm just gonna say it right there. <laughs> the guys who ran against her, they couldn't count votes, and she counted them, <laughs> and she won, all right? And she got the majority. Anyway, just just to put that, put that out there. Um, but no, I think that's women, I feel like as organizers, um, in many ways, if you can't count it, you don't know if it really happened. Um, I mean, I think they're, I'm trying to be more flexible in my older age about like what, what uh, you know, things like storytelling and things that also matter. But being able to count um, and deliver and be accountable is something that I think is like a core, it's like a core part of, of, of organizing. Although the funny thing is, and I think this is a, it's, it's sort of an opposite problem we have now, which is, you know, most of my life I was spent like trying to, you know, engage people and convince them we needed to do more. Now, it's, it's in a way it's completely different, which is like there's this like tsunami of women coming out saying, now what do we do? And so it's, it's like any room, you just put up the bat signal and it's like full, right? And so the question now is much more, how do you take all this energy and put people into motion and, and, and um, allow everybody to do more and also feel like they're doing it together. And not everybody has to do the same thing. So it's a really interesting organizing time. It's the most interesting organizing moment of my life where um, everybody wants to. This is something crazy. Kaiser, I think I wrote this in the book. The Kaiser Foundation actually did a, did a survey that estimates that one in five people in this country have marched since the last election. Or taken part in a protest. Isn't that amazing? Um, and that's so that's way beyond my own family. And um, <laughs> but and the number one the number one issue has been women's rights. Um, so that's pretty powerful. If you can get 20% of this country in motion, you can change the situation in America. Well, from so your, let's do from it. your yeah. lips to <laughs> goddesses' ears. Um, from the audience, somebody asks, how can men support women in ending misogyny? Do better. <laughs> Do better, yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot. Actually, it's funny. I was here with Amber Tamblin the other night um, for her book event, and we were talking about this a little bit, is, one, thank you that there was a man in the audience that asked that question. Because I, just like racism is not people of color's problem, it's white people's problem, right? And we've got to take, same thing about misogyny. That's actually not women's problem. That's men's problem. And so I think this is where um, I hope that men 
one, we got to invite them in because we can't solve this problem alone mm-hmm. as women. Um, but I think just like I think it's incumbent on white women to think more about what we can do um, and, and need to do on the issue of race and racism and white privilege, I think it would be awesome to have more men actually interrogating for themselves what more can they do um, to uh, support women's equality, to raise children who understand um, that that equality is an important value. And so I think, and maybe that's a book we need to write. I don't know. Right? But I do but think it's two. like, I do think men are saying, like, it's taken them a while, but they're saying, yeah, what can I do? Uh, how can I do more? And again, I don't think it's women's issue to solve, but I think women also are uh, willing to have men, mm-hmm. men allies get on the, get on the bus with us. Right. I, I mean, I hope so. I think so. I, I think, think so. so. But I do think, look, I think it's, um, I mean, it's amazing. This is just like a little factoid that just, is, so with all the progress women have made, right, we're now, um, more than half the college students, half the law students, medical students, or almost half the workforce. Um, we're still 78th in the world in political representation for women. I think we're right behind Somalia. And um, so that's another thing men can do is move over and make some space for women to be in office too. Listen, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, somebody asked also, what are your thoughts on the heartbeat, on the heartbeat bills that um, all of the different states are like passing right now? Well, I mean, that's just unbelievable. I, I think Mississippi is, you know, is the latest. But essentially, they're, they're, they're passing legislation that makes abortion illegal uh, for most people before they, many people before they even know they're pregnant. Mm-hmm. And these are obviously all set up to go to challenge the tenants of Roe at the Supreme Court. So I think we are going to see now... Um, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm of the belief just because I talked to the smart lawyers at Planned Parenthood and ACLU. I don't think there's going to be a case. I just think that as we've been seeing over the years, it's just slowly but surely eroding access. Um, and I think the result of these bills, because of course they're being passed in states that usually have the least access to reproductive health care as it is, um, the, the, the worst thing to me about all this legislation is it hurts women of color, it hurts women of low income, it hurts women in certain geographies uh, more than others. And um, I mean, the Mississippi bill, I think, yeah, if you have to have an abortion within the first six weeks and there's only one provider in the state of Mississippi, I mean, just there's just so many uh, ways in which it's outrageous and obviously is getting challenged. Um, I just, you know, it's just crazy to me. I think focus on the things we actually need to solve, which is that there are millions of people in this country that don't have access to basic health care. Why aren't politicians focused on that? Or focus on the fact that the maternal mortality rate in this country is on the rise, and for African American women, really on the rise? We're the only developed nation where the maternal mortality rate is going up. Why don't they focus on things like that that are real problems? But that's why we have to change who's in office, I think, right? Agreed. I just can't wait. It's like, as I say, like when half of Congress can get pregnant, we're finally going to start addressing <laughs> these issues, right? Um, I know that there is a young reader's version of the book. I'm so um, excited. I yeah. just got this. Is this so cool? So it's pretty this cool. brilliant woman has made, sorry, just have to hold it up. I'm so proud. Um, yeah, it's coming out in the fall. It's Make Trouble for Young Women. Because isn't that great? I love that. I know. <laughs> um, because young women are the best troublemakers. And if they're troublemakers as young women, watch out. Fun. I'm into it. Um, do you have any plans for a second book? Um, I besides don't really, the cookbook, obviously. Besides the cookbook, I know. Obviously. Yeah. Um, I actually have been thinking about... I actually... It's interesting. So, sorry, just bear with me a second. There's a lot of attention being paid to the fact that women are now running for office and winning, and that's awesome, and that is great, and it's long overdue. But also, women are doing everything else, too. Mm-hmm. And I actually do think that in the next two years women are gonna completely determine what happens politically in this country. Because if you look at it, not only are women candidates, women are the activists. I mean, in every campaign, 
Um, and in fact, when we when we beat back the defunding of Planned Parenthood, the estimates by folks call that of, of the folks who were calling into Congress, 86% of them were women. Okay, so I mean, women are like on family separation, on w women teachers, you know, on strike in these, uh, you know, red states for public education. So women are like fueling all of the activism. They're volunteering on the campaigns. Even Beto's campaign in Texas, the estimate was that 75% of the volunteers were women, right? Women are the majority of voters. 54% of the last electorate, right, was were women, um, which means 46% were men. Just saying, right? If you do the math, um, and one of the other interesting things is that in this last election, a hundred million dollars more was donated by women to political candidates and campaigns than two years earlier when Hillary Clinton ran for president. Wow. Now that's a lot of grassroots money, and that's a lot of grassroots power. Um, and we see, of course, it's not just in the U.S., but women around the world are just doing extraordinary things. And one of the things I loved this this last year was seeing, you know, women uh, in Ireland uh, fighting back and actually finally uh, decriminalizing abortion, and all the women who flew home um, home to vote campaign. So I think that. Um, if I wrote a book, it would really be about this power of women at this moment in all these different ways. And if women only knew their power right now, we could change everything. And not incremental change, but really, really get full equality. And that's what women want. They don't want more than their fair share. They just want to be treated equally. And I think we're on the cusp of this. So that might be book two. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. Um, when do you feel the most powerful, like you are walking in your power? Walking in my power. That sounds like a Brooklyn thing. Is sounds, that something you it do? Sounds, like, it's, <laughs> listen, it's very Oprah, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, know. We don't do that in Texas, yeah, you know walking I mean? in our power. If, you, if you're thinking, I, like, I, I guess I ask because I think that I hear this a lot. A lot of people saying, like, women are powerful. We're doing powerful things. I never hear that on an individual level. Like, I, you know, yeah. like, I feel powerful and I so so I always wonder like what does that mean to you like when do you feel like you actually are holding power and you are you are doing things that are derived from um, from that feeling that you have I think it's when I'm in uh, well I'll, t I'll tell you the last two years I think the time I felt most powerful was was having the real privilege of getting to stand on the stage in Washington, D.C. and see millions and millions and millions of women and, and men and daughters and mothers and grandmothers on the mall in Washington, D.C. as far as I could see. That feels powerful. And I think that is increasingly, or, you know, I mean, going to North Carolina out in the middle of nowhere and having standing room only women coming together um, at a book event. But really what it was, was um, an encounter session where everyone just wanted to find out what more they can do. And that to me is, I think what is this interesting, uh, I mean, I think which is important is that when my mom ran for off, my mom was in the original, I mean, when she found out the women's movement was happening, when we lived in Dallas, it was like, Oh my God, she never like looked back. That was like, this is fabulous. And you know, it was like this revelation for women, but they didn't really have any power, but they were fighting anyway. And when she even ran for governor, it wasn't like there were many, she was kind of a unicorn. There were not a lot of women um, in office and then there obviously still aren't enough. And I don't think that women were as conscious of supporting other women as they are now. And now what I hear in the country, um, when I'm asking women when they feel powerful, it's when they've seen other women do something that makes them proud and that they feel connected to. And um, whether it was Oprah, you know, speaking at the Golden Globes, and um, whether it was Christine Blasey Ford, you know, speaking, um, during the Kavanaugh hearings, uh, whether it's seeing young women uh, in the March for Our Lives, you know, s taking off from school, risking, you know, being suspended and, and doing it anyway. That to me is what feels powerful. And that's why I think this moment is so exciting, is women taking, the jo taking joy in the success of other women in a way I have never seen before. You must see it every day on your show. I mean, sometimes. <laughs> well, not I'm seeing it right now. Um, Okay, so you're doing a lot. You're going on tour again. Yeah. When when you take a break, what is that going to look like? Uh, when I take a break, mm -hmm. um, 
well, hmm, okay. Are you a walks on the beach person? Oh, God, no. You oh, a, my God, no. Are you a no, no. scandal I'm not a on Thursday on the beach. person? No, I may like, you know, oh, my God, maybe we could like find another kind of pasta we could make by hand <laughs> in the kitchen and <laughs> do some impossible thing. No, I mean, I, I'm not really that kind of person. Um, I think, <laughs> I know this is going to come as a shock to you. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to really like take a break when we win the election in 2020. And that I'm just like totally like <laughs> eyes on the prize. Um, because I, I think that it's, I just feel like it's there and that women, women are the most powerful force in this country. I mean, the leadership in this country is not coming from Washington, D.C. It's coming from women at the grassroots. And so getting to be part of that and getting to work with a, a, a group of other women who are committed to building women's power for women's equality um, is better than any beach vacation I can think of. Honest to God. Listen, I love that. What a great place to end. You are the best, Cecile. It's Thank so great. You so much. And Amina's writing a book, okay? So <laughs> it is very exciting. So we're going to be back together in, in a year reversed. doing this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're the best. Thank you.